How are you? Welcome to the Entrepreneur Experiment podcast with me, Gary Fox. Today, my guest is Dan Nugent, the co-founder of Ever Amber. He is building a brand new business in the performance and longevity space. Here's my chat with Dan Nugent. Dan, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Gary. It's good to be back. 20, older, older and wiser. 7th of August, 2019. 2019? Yes, I was, uh, I was a naive, young, cocky book who had yet to be uh, worn down by the, uh, the, on, the world of entrepreneurship. I was not young, but I was definitely naive. That You were one, I think I, st- I started actually, sorry, I did. I started in March 2019, so you were one of my first guests. Really? Yeah, 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 it was cool. I actually, re- yeah, I remember it very well. We were, <clears throat> I think that was post um, Amber being Stockton Brown Thomas, and I think that was the kind of um, topic, the main topic. I think that was the title of the episode Yeah. from... From bedroom to Brian Thomas. I think it like sounds that. like something I'd write to be Some, fair. Yeah. Something, something like that. <laughs> something clickbaity yeah. like that. Yeah, good times. <clears throat> so talk to me. What was what were you doing then? Back then, mm. yes. Yeah, back then, um, I, I I'm sure not all of your listeners know, but hopefully some of them do. Um, I started an e-commerce brand called Amber Eyewear with my then girlfriend, now now wife Sasha. Um, that was in May 2017. Um, <clears throat> we had this idea, um, you know, we, we had, we had just had a young, we just had a baby um, and, you know, our social life had uh, become non-existent. We were spending a lot of time in the evening, you know, watching TV and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, Jesus, like, we feel like we should be doing something more productive with our time. Um, and uh, co- coincidentally, then at the same time, I had started hearing about blue light as a concept from podcasts, etc., cetera. Um, and I just bought a cheap pair of Amazon to to help me with that excessive screen time that I was now having because I have to stay indoors to when the baby's asleep and not be out with my friends. And so they, and it was just one of those eureka moments when me and Sasha were like, she's a designer and I've always had an interest in e-com and just like selling in general. Um, and we were like, oh, it'd be really cool if we just like started our own business with all this time that we have. Um, and I love it that you just had a baby and you're like, we've all this time now. Ge- genuinely, I know people say that it, it has the actual opposite effect, but you find that like, you know, you're, you're home an awful lot more. So you like your evenings are a lot, you've so much more time in the evenings. You have pockets of time. Because you're, you're not out having pints or anything like that, you know, like, which is also great. But, um, you know, we didn't want to waste that time watching TV. Like I love watching TV or whatever, but like every night it, it was a bit excessive. Like let's do something productive here. She's a really talented designer. I had a bit of business <laughs> acumen, I suppose. Um, and we're like, well, what will we sell? We'll set up a website. I've seen Shopify, sounds cool. Um, and then she just like looked at me and was like, what about those, those glasses? Because the ones you're wearing are horrendous, uh, but they work really well. Like they've made a big difference to like your headaches and your sleep and stuff. You were early on the blue light. Cause I remember you telling me this back, back 2019. And even then I was like, oh yeah, I've heard something about this, but you yeah. were very early, Ve- 2017. You were very, very early. early. There was really only one brand in the US that was doing it <clears throat> at the time. So yeah, like very early. Um, and then, you know, we cobbled together a few quid that we had. It wasn't much. We were mid twenties. Um, and at that, you know, if you, if you're not putting a, a gigantic amount of money into your initial manufacturing run, you, you, and you want to buy small quantities um, it's, uh, you don't have much like leverage for like customization and, you know, your own designs and stuff. So, you know, we, we, we had like a white, white labeled product initial, initial stock, with blue light lenses, but there was just nobody, nobody else doing it in Ireland. And um, we designed a brand and a logo and everything in a, in a few days. Worked on the website, friends down for photography, blah blah blah. Put it all together, and I think we put two thousand quid into it. Um, and uh, yeah, like within launched the website, it, thinking if we made our money back, it would be great. Ended up being all over like Love in Dublin, Sunday Sunday Independent loads of media attention straight away influencers i remember i met Roz purcell gave her a pair she posted about them so within two weeks we'd sold out of the initial run and had like a month of back orders um, why do you think that was or was it just timing good marketing what was it i think it was i think it was just a novel product and I, it just it just addressed a very simple and common problem that people were having which is like i'm increasingly spending more time on my phone or on my laptop and my eyes start to hurt this this is a solution here and it looks cool and it's cheap and it's an Irish brand and it, I'm definitely going to give it a try. Mm-hmm. So it caught on um, and also it's a very word of mouth type product. Like you're sitting in Facebook office 
some person beside you just randomly starts wearing glasses one day. You're like, why are you wearing those glasses? I told you your eyesight was fine. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh no, they're blue. Like, <clears throat> yeah. So then you, you would see like one order in Google and then it would like multiple orders from Google, multiple orders from Zendesk, multiple orders from Facebook. Um, yeah, and it was, it was crazy. Like, you know, we were just like very young, n- first business um, and it was wild like just to see the attention that it got at the start and like we had n- no idea how... how how big it would eventually get like it's still it was always the relatively small business in the grand scheme of things but for us um the way it grew over the preceding five years was just insane and just so so much fun like the whole thing um see that was the, that was the initial story um, and we just kind of snowballed from that initial batch of back orders like mm. that fund of the next production run we gra- gradually got bigger snowballed more frames gradually got more kind of input into the design and the way we wanted stuff to look professionalized everything until we got to a point in February 2021 I know we've skipped a long time there we'll probably cover that that uh, period of time where we'd sold glasses in like 80 different countries wow um you know almost done like what like nearly three million quid in revenue um and yeah Brent Thomas stockists like really was just like totally random incredible thing to happen um well, it's the perfect story that everybody loves. You literally mm. built it from the kitchen table, the like. kitchen table, mm. like it, and it's it's the entrepreneurial story we all love. So we're like, that could be me, that, can, and you literally 100%. did it. You and Sasha literally did it, and it's it's they're the kind of stories that I love on the podcast because it's it's achievable. Now there's a lot of talent and a lot of hard work and a lot of luck that goes into these things, but you literally built it from the bedroom up. Over the past five years in this podcast, I've spoken to so many amazing Irish businesses who started from a single idea and grown to become world-class companies able to compete with the very best on the international stage. And many of those started and grew with the help of their local enterprise office. From starting up to growing to becoming more sustainable or digitization, your local enterprise office has everything you need to make that happen for your business. Visit localenterprise.ie or click the link in the podcast description. Okay, you know me. You know I'm massively into my health, fitness and training. But there's one thing I haven't spoken about before. And that is a product I take every single day. It's a product called Resilience and it's made by an Irish company called Ethos. What's kind of funny is that every single entrepreneur I meet, that is the one characteristic they have, incredible resilience. So I like that little play on words. It's a multifunctional supplement that supports cognitive function, immunity, which is super important this time of year, energy levels, and it keeps stress at bay. I also love it because it's easy. If you're bringing anything new habit into your life, it has to be easy and taking resilience is so simple. I simply mix it in a glass of water every single morning and I always throw a couple of extra in my gym bag to keep them with me. It's a really tasty blood orange flavor as well. It takes all the boxes. It has B vitamins, amino acids, vitamin C and adaptogens like reishi mushroom and ashwagandha. So if you want to try it, I think you should. Go to weareethos.com and because I like it so much, the guys will give me a discount code. So if you go to weareethos.com enter Gary Fox at the checkout you get 20% off which makes taking resilience about a euro a day which is an unbelievable price for building some inner resilience check out weareethos.com if you've been listening for a while you know Iconic Offices have been my partner for ages now working and recording out of their flexible workspaces has meant a huge deal to the success of this podcast so it made perfect sense to partner up with them again for season 17 but to give you, my fellow entrepreneurs, a unique offer. Come work in the Iconic Office workspaces for free with no catches. Simply visit the link in the description below and enter Gary24 for a free day pass or a free day office pass. Enjoy. So like you, you bring last 2019 is when we last spoke and you just gone to Brent Thomas and things were flying. Then bring us up, you were saying up to kind of 2020, things were going really well. Yeah, things were going really well. We we had our you know we had our own office, expanded the range, um, making it a full time job, which was great because um, I think the biggest benefit of that is that we got to be with Aurora, who's my daughter. Um, you know, we got to spend so much time with her up until the age of you know, five or six, um, ticking over nicely. You know, we were we were doing able to pay our wage, blah blah blah, uh, and then COVID hit, uh, and we didn't really know what the impact of that would be whether it was going to be negative or positive um, on, on Amber, it turned out it was an overwhelming positive. Um, and because, you know, people were 
in quarantine and lockdown and spending a lot of time indoors and screens, th these type of glasses became like this huge trending product worldwide. Um, and, you know, if you just look at like Google search trend from back then, just the term like blue light glasses, it just like spikes. So like universal demand across the world for this type of product, not in particular amber eyewear, but luckily we had kind of formed a small little base mm -hmm. as a reliable, uh, well-liked product. So we obviously benefited massively from that in Ireland. Um, and overnight, like the sales just went like 5x, um, which comes with its own challenges. You know, you've got to keep your stock. I was going to ask you, how running. did you manage that during COVID? Um, I mean, in, in, intuition a, a, a lot of the time. Um, I didn't always get it right, but um, basically always, I am, I am not a very, uh, I suppose, like analytical and... Um, I'm not great at planning, maybe. I'm more like spontaneous and, um, what's the word? I'm, I'm kind of like spontaneous and impulsive, whatever. So um, a more mathematical mind than me might have like, you know, forecasted out stock better. But I would be like, can I curse? Curse yeah, away. I'd be like, fuck it, I'm just going to buy a shitload of an inventory. I think that'll be enough. Yeah. We'll just... We'll just you're God, you're we'll, relying yeah, on God. Well, you're God, it got you that far. I always have like kind of like a, a like a, a inventory levels in my mind of like particular frames just from looking at them because we self fulfilled through the through the whole time. Um, so I would just like buy a, buy a big lot of stock. Hopefully it would arrive on time. Hopefully there was no disruption. Um, and I mean there was one time it did actually have have it a, had a big problem. Um, we so you can ship glasses and you can you can ship them by air. And it can only it can arrive in Ireland within like, you know, shipping time could be like five days, wow. and, you, and you get them if it's air if it's air shipped, but uh, with cases and boxes and packaging and stuff, you know, you're getting them made. <coughs> they are heftier, and they would be too expensive to ship by air. So you have to ship them by sea, and because you have to ship them by sea, you have to be far more organized um, and forecasted out well. Which I made a massive error once, um, and we had hundreds and hundreds of orders coming through like every day and no cases to put them in. So I found myself in a situation where I was driving around Dublin uh, and beyond actually going to every single deals in Dublin and just picking up like boxes of their really naff like pink hard cases, like cheap one yeah, euro yeah. hard cases and bringing them back. And for like a period of like two months, maybe a month, we had to like send every single order out in these like non-branded disgusting um like multicolored or leopard skin cases to people but just we, to get them done just to get it done yeah. but we always like included um we included like a little um a little card with it and it was like written by me and sasha it was like probably it was too long it was like i'm so so sorry about this but we didn't have a choice blah 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 offering some offering them like a 30 percent discount on their next purchase and actually in hindsight that turned out to be a benefit like a net benefit like people would write back going like um oh i loved your i loved that card i will definitely support you again thank you for the discount code um, i think sometimes when you buy from a brand you forget there's real people behind it yeah. no sometimes there isn't sometimes they're big faceless <clears throat> brands but i think it's so refreshing when you're like oh my god yeah there's people actually putting this in a box for me caring enough to actually write it write a little note yeah so it actually turned into a good like customer loyalty unintentional strategy yeah. people loved it They'd genius guerrilla marketing yeah sending messages going like i loved that card uh, you know i hope you get through random people like i hope you get through the difficulties and um, so that time was hectic like and it coincided with the birth of uh theo who's our second child he was born i think he was born on black friday no way. Yeah, in in twenty twenty, perfect um, for e commerce retailers to child was born in, Black Friday. I was in the uh, post delivery ward on my laptop, writing back to multiple customer support emails, um, much to Sasha's dismay. But I mean, that was just the time it was. It was just like we. It was such a hectic, unpredictable burst yeah. of sales that all these things just had, they just had to be dealt with. You just had to think on your feet. Um, like it was a fun time. It was mad to be just like sitting at home and just your phone, Shopify, cha-ching, 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 like over and over again. So anyway, uh, I, I thought we'd like made it then. Like, you know, I thought this is it. Like, you know, we've got this product. Everybody you said a 5X it. increase in sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow. to the point where we were, I mean, again, I, I will reiterate that I know it's still a small business, but for us to do you know, 
well over 100 grand in revenue per month randomly just like uh, all of a sudden was quite mind blowing um and you know we we did actually deal with it quite well and and didn't run into any major stock issues we were able to get the stock out um but uh yeah we weren't prepared for what would happen um very suddenly in march 2021 when things kind of started to go back to back to normal again and Amber Eyewear unfortunately fell, fell foul to the uh, e-com apocalypse that happened like pretty much worldwide around that time. You know, the s- stores opened again, that rising exponential spike in shopping from home uh, not only didn't only plateau, but, but properly fell off a cliff. Was it like night and day? Was it like someone flicking a switch? I could, I could, f- I could feel it like you know you you can almost like feel the atmosphere especially when you're like so ingrained in in Shopify and you kind of you see your sales come through on your on your phone or whatever but there was something like like obviously February was great but then March just just didn't have that same Mm. energy about it you know um and you know March you know sales are down like 60% from February wow you're like oh hopefully that's just an anomaly April, another 50%, you know? Uh, And the problem that I had was that I had, you know, taken the optimist route and the the gambler in me, like the the impulsive entrepreneur, always taking risks. Um, It's a big problem I have, by the way, just literally no risk aversion. So all the cash that we'd been making with Amber um, poured it back into inventory. Um, and then when the sales dipped, you know, not only worldwide e-com, but also because it was quite a trending product, which I didn't anticipate as well as I should have, <clears throat> sales fall off a cliff. You're left with a shitload of inventory, um, but no working capital or cash to actually sell that inventory in terms of marketing or, you know, any sort of promotional activity or anything that you can get the hype back up again. And so, yeah, left left me in a personally quite a quite a rough space, I would say still does. And but like that was February 2021, March 2021. And by the time it got to the end of the year and we were almost like 90 percent down on on like what the year on year monthly sales would have been. Yeah. And I mean, luckily, you know, it was only me and Sasha. So we didn't have anybody to fire or anything like that well luckily or unluckily you're both involved in it like i mean both involved i think i think we forget we forget now looking back we forget how unpredictable the world was then we literally oh it's open now it's closed you Mm. can go out you can't go out you can go 5k you can't go 5k so to predict for entrepreneurs like you or any of us to predict what was going to happen was next to night impossible Mm. like it really was because how could you not kind of go okay well we need to keep going because it might have gone on for way longer you didn't want to left out stock yeah. either so it's really one of those you're damned if you do and damned if you don't i think in that situation oh yeah and hindsight is, hindsight is a good thing there's lots of things i mean i have experience now i know what i would have done differently i know yes. what i should have done differently um but so at the end of 2021 um, i just i made the decision really that you know my myself and sasha are this is our sole income we've got two kids now we don't own a house um i should probably you know um, kind of retract from this uh, I, I need to just you know, take time back from this because it's causing me far too much stress um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just find a proper job for 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 a while anyway and that's a hard decision how did you come to that um I, just, I just couldn't really take the the stress of it to be honest like it was uh, I probably nobody really knows apart from Sasha but like I, I'm very competitive and like very ambitious and to see something that you were like fully sure was going to result in a really exceptional like life for you, your family and um, to be kind of like decimated beyond your control overnight um, is kind of tough to take. And then of course you've got issues like um, like nothing too serious but like creditors and stuff that like you're like look i i actually can't pay that now you, you need to have a bit of patience with me and the situation never really been in before 
An example of that, and it's quite topical at the moment, would be the uh, like the the tax warehousing. The that warehousing the scheme. Warehousing tax, thing. Yeah. So if you imagine that period of time that I speak of, when you know five X sales or whatever, um, you're you're paying twenty three percent VAT on those sales, right? But you you're, you're you're also growing. Well, you presume you're growing. So if I, I if I want to if I want to like take, if I want to capture that demand, that, that demand that I'm seeing in the future, I need to spend my profits now on stock to capture that demand. Um, and when that demand doesn't happen and you're haven't, and you have the, the VAT bill left over, but now you've got all stock, no sales, mm. you get yourself into a tricky situation. So that was kind of one example of like how such, such a sudden dip can, can kind of cause that so um i think my conclusion at the end of 21 2021 was like um i'm gonna get a, get a proper job i'm gonna remove myself from the wage bill um just to, to kind of free up a little bit of liquidity and begin to just start kind of clearing that backlog of stuff that needs to be paid um and it's funny like that's actually continued on for pretty much nearly two years um, and Sasha left later. She joined Sculpted by Amy as a graphic designer. So we've we freed up like you know all the salary bill, and we're able to kind of like tick Amber along over the last two years with repeat business, organic, mm. that kind of stuff. Because we didn't really have any cash to, to like put into any marketing initiatives to launch like exciting new products. So that's kind of what's happened over the last two years. Is that I've just kind of cut the costs down completely and this is a common theme actually with a lot of e-commerce brands um and just kind of let it leanly very very leanly tick over um while i use that kind of cash just to kind of you know uh get it back on track almost rebuild know? yeah and mm. that's why i was so interested to chat to you because the world's in a funny place at the minute like there's mm. a lot has changed and a lot of stuff is still going through the system so it's really interesting you bring it up like the bat where i was and things like that there's still a lot that people haven't dealt with mm. there's still a lot that people are still dealing with from covid so it's interesting for you to be able to like give us a great example of how does it really affect people Pe people would say people would say you're stupid because you should have just paid it at the time but the example that i gave is like how how could i you know, I had to I had to be optimistic. Like, you know, you're you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner. You you obviously have to see like the ambition. And um, I never thought it would like you know be that much of a dip. So I always thought I'd be able to pay back. But I feel I feel very sorry for for a lot of businesses, particularly in the restaurant industry, where you know margins are so tight yeah. anyway, and they've availed of all these COVID supports just and to look, stay alive. I mean, it probably cases, is quite yeah. naive to <clears throat> to kick the can down the road and be like, I'll worry about that in two years. But like, what are you supposed to do at the time, you know? And then you have a situation now where it's where they're reading it in, um, and I think maybe with like something like Amber, who will get into like a rebranding called Ever Amber now as the business, um, it's okay because you know it's not as tricky in terms of like margins and stuff. You can there's there's potential there to to deal with like a fat, fat warehousing, but I think with restaurants and stuff, it's going to be mightily tough. Because they're walked, being squeezed at all yeah, angles. I walked through town last week. Last <clears throat> this day last week, um, I walked all across town for different meetings and different different things I had on, and I was genuinely shocked by the amount of closures. I literally went to walk into one place that I used to always go for lunch. <clears throat> and literally banged into the door, and it was just a sign up and thing going. Thanks for the loyal custom. We've now mm. closed, and you're like, damn it. Like, and then it was like then because you see it once, you start seeing it everywhere. You're like, oh my god, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone. And we start waking up, going. The city's in a real funny spot at the minute. Mm. Really, really unusual spot between closures. And I think there is a lot of things now coming home to roost. Mm. Yeah, and I think, like, obviously with that, it's the, it's the double whammy, isn't it? It's like uh, there's not much people in town. You know, this is like, you have the work from home thing, which is great, like, on a personal level. But um, town must be suffering pretty badly. From, from there has to be a big rebalance because like you said that people are only working maybe Tuesday, Wednesday in town or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in town. Mm. What do these places do on a Monday and a Friday? 100%. They still have to pay the rates. They still have to have the lights on. They still have to have their staff. But like I, I've chatted to businesses, they're down 50, 60% on a Monday, Friday. God. Ugh. It's not doable. Like. Yeah. And that with like energy costs and, and stuff. I, um, I, think, they, I think it's going to I think when May 2024, 20, which is when they, their 
calling in the final uh, agreement that needs to be made with for the tax warehousing when that rolls around it's probably going to get a lot worse and there's billions there's billions owed billions yeah. yeah I have a lot of sympathy for people obviously I'm one of them and I'm biased but but you know unpredictable times I I think it's going to kill a lot of a lot of small businesses luckily I think we're I think we're we're, we're okay it wasn't you know too big so I'll well you to also to faced up to it though, right? <clears throat> that that's just got to deal with it over that's time. also the thing I think that's what a lot of people aren't doing they're not facing up to it and kind of going right how do we start chipping away at this and like i mean what you did go back to take a job like that's one of the toughest decisions as a business owner you can make you're like right i'm gonna keep going but now i'm gonna double my workload so you went and got mm. a job what'd you do um so as i said to you before we started recording there was only really two two places that i that i wanted to work um and and i'm a big proponent of if i'm gonna work somewhere it's, it has to be somewhere that's going to teach me something about what i want to do in the future, which is, I was obsessed with e-commerce, I just love selling stuff online and brands and products and stuff. So there was two places that I had in mind. Um, literally, I wouldn't have got a job if, if I didn't get a job in one of those two places. And that was Shopify or Wayflyer. Um, I had a backstory with, obviously Shopify is Shopify, you know, um, but with Wayflyer, it was the period of time where they were getting a lot of media attention. I had a previous kind of link to Wayflyer in that when Amber in late 2019, uh, we had a pop-up shop um, just off Grafton Street on Wicklow Street for the Christmas period. Um, you were there, had a big big party. Yeah, it was big cool. Lunch DJ, party. very fancy. DJ, very cool. Um, great times, innocent times. <laughs> um, and Jack Pierce came in to the shop one day and introduced himself and told me he had a, uh, a new company that was funding e-commerce businesses. And he was looking for... Irish companies to test out the concept offered me um, a few grand to I had to pay it back now but offered me a few grand for inventory and to and at the time I was lucky because I actually from opening the shop you're, you're kind of like double your inventory needs so I was a bit tight and I was like Jesus this is very convenient so um, I actually that turned out to be Wayflower's first customer so I was Wayflower's first customer and kept in touch with Jack um, watched from afar as that business went hyperbolic um, so there was no between that and Shopify there was no other place that I wanted to work so applied for a job in Wayflyer more of it on the techie side of things didn't get it but then got uh, contacted by Jack personally um, to join this kind of new team of e-commerce people that he was forming um, in Wayflyer post series B that were going to try and like figure out and test new products for e-commerce people um, so I obviously jumped at the chance of that. So that, that's that's where that's where I went, and I was I was delighted. Like you know, they cou couldn't be in a better environment mm. to learn about what I did wrong, study what the best in class are doing, uh, and like sit and stew on that for two years and plot how you can come back for like round two now that you are battle hardened and more experienced. It's so. a stroke genius, I have to say. When I saw you go there, I was like, that's a really interesting move because. It's kind of what I thought you were doing was was just kind of like soaking up all this knowledge. I mean, Wayflyer in the last four or five years, like they're the one of the biggest success stories to come out of Ireland. <clears throat> Aiden was on the pod a couple of years ago. Unbelievable story. And I mean, as an e-com guy, there couldn't have been a better place to go. So what was like, what was like getting in there and getting involved? What was that journey like? Well, you instantly realized that. Um, I always actually think of, uh, you know, like the Dunning-Kruger scale oh, yeah where you know at the start you're like you you're ignorant but you you don't know you're ignorant and you think you're an expert yeah that's that's where i was you know 2017 to 2021 almost but you don't know what you don't know i always say this you don't know you're an expert you're like yeah. i am the greatest person alive i am you know running this six figure a month e-commerce shop store i know everything well to yeah. be fair expert in a niche area that you know intimately so like we're all experts in some in some way oh, but then when you go abroad you're like oh wow didn't yeah. even know that room was in there. Exactly. What I'm saying is I thought I was an expert, but turns out I wasn't. So you, like you step foot in the door and you see people who are um, everything that I'm not, which is like, I, as I said before, like I'm like impulsive and not very, like, uh, not very risk averse. Is risk averse? Does that mean, that means I don't like risk? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm not you're, risk averse. You're very highly risk tolerant. Risk tolerant. That's the word. Um, and obsessed with like, product and branding and visual stuff and marketing and you know that type of thing but when you go into wayflyer you're like oh this is all the stuff that i'm not good at so mm. this is like 
planning and financial prudence, um, how to manage growth of a fast e-commerce business. Like what, what are the common pitfalls? I pretty much fell for all of them. Um, how do you deal with that from like a managing a cash flow perspective? Um, also like how does performance marketing impact your financial health, all that type of stuff. Um, and, and that was like a real eye opener to me um, to see how someone from a finance background views an e-commerce co- company. You know, when you're, when you're starting out as an e-commerce brand or possibly most e-commerce founders pre-2021, you're looking at that Shopify total revenue figure as your North Star, as your like metric going, oh, I made whatever today, brilliant. But in a kind of a post-COVID world where margins are tighter, advertising costs are a little bit more, that that's just a vanity figure you know mm. what really matters is like what at the end of the day like what is that actual profit you're making per unit um revenue it, is vanity profit is sanity yeah. ex- exactly like you know and um i quickly realized there that like in the whole history of amber regardless of how much i had sold how many units i'd sold and the success ultimately i just actually wasn't really making any money like you know when when like operating expenses and advertising costs are taken into account the the margin was just too small to to uh to to function long term so you see all this and you see some of the best like u.s brands that are customers of wayflower like wayflower's main customer base is the u.s like you you couldn't ask to be learning off a better cohort of e-commerce companies they're very far ahead when it comes to e-commerce and d2c i think like light years ahead light years ahead and you're being exposed to this every day and you see like you, you, you see like it, it actually is a transferable formula for e-commerce brands you need a certain percentage of gross margin and you should not exceed a certain percentage of revenue on wages like um well, well like multiple other best in class financial benchmarking that i had never even considered mm. for for amber i just rolled with it this is plucking a price point out of out of thin air, thinking that like you know oh yeah that's enough, and people might laugh at that, but I actually would be amazed how many e-commerce founders are like that. They just have no concept of the underlying financial metrics that make up a successful. A e-commerce. lot of founders in general, to be honest, a lot of founders are yeah. very <clears throat> poor on the pricing thing because generally what you see is they undervalue themselves. Hundred percent to undercut competitors. So like over the last couple of years, whatever there's been. Since I've been working at Wayflower, I see people trying like maybe some some people try copy Amber, and then other just general general companies that pop up on my Instagram feed with ads or whatever, and I just know in my head instantly that they will be out of business in three months mm-hmm. because you're like you cannot possibly charge thirty euro for a pair of glasses once VAT is taken into account, once shipping costs are taken into account, you're you're done like this. And true enough, every single time, it rings true. Um, so getting that masterclass in Wayflyer over the last two years and being, being exposed to like incredibly smart people in there, also young as well. Like it is an insanely young company, um, considering the the um, success it's had, mm. um, has just been like as 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 you said previously, like it's been like a like a masterclass or a, a PhD. You said something to me in our very first episode back 2019. I was like, oh man, e-commerce, that's so cool. And you're like, yes, it is. But every single day I get up, I have to find a new customer. Yeah. And that has shaped how I look at businesses, how I look at business models ever since that day. I was like, he's dead right because yeah. people aren't buying glasses every second week. No. I was like, so it, it, it shapes how I picture business models now from that one conversation we have. What has changed in your head since 2019, since 2020, since you went to work for Wayflower? What has shifted? So to give an anecdote, right, May in uh, 2020, myself and Sasha became, <clears throat> we were finalists in an image magazine company of the year, brand of the year or something like that. And the same, some of the other nominees at the time, and we were all in City Hall and it was a lovely occasion or whatever, um, we did a really good pitch. A um, few people came up and said, like, oh, you should have won. It was such a good pitch. Jim Plus Coffee actually won. Amy Connolly was there. Um, she was also a nominee. Somebody else. And you look at the trajectory of those companies. And That's then a you, strong year. It was, it was a good, yeah, it was a good year. I, I think there's a few, there's definitely a few other companies there. So p- apologies if I've left them out and they, they see this. 
But you see the trajectory of Jim plus coffee and you see the trajectory of Sculpted by Amy. Um, now, obviously, it's down to like exceptionally talented founders, great products, blah, blah, blah. But also, they are products that have an extremely high lifetime value, you know, especially cosmetics. You know, you buy Amy Connolly's product. You're not going to keep that makeup for four years like you do with an amber eyewear pair of glasses and not spend any money until they eventually break you're going to like use the makeup, it's consumable, and then you're going to purchase it again in three months' time. Gym plus coffee with apparel, if there's a reason why it's the most popular e-com sector, most popular thing that people want to start, is because I can sell you loads of clothes. Do you know what I mean? You're yeah. only going to buy one pair of glasses mostly. Yeah, you're not just going to buy one hoodie and wear it every single day. So it sounds so obvious, but but that was something that I I didn't really totally understand or possibly accept with amber and <clears throat> i see customers now and they come back and they buy they buy a pair and you, you kind of just see the customer history or whatever and it's like they bought their first pair in 2019 so for those four years that customer has just been like like, like there but i have nothing to sell them mm. i've had nothing to sell them it's a wasted acquisition almost so you, you spend I mean? all the money building the relationship and getting them over the line and yeah. then nothing and then it's just like and they might love the brand they show their friends like oh i have this really cool pair of irish this uh, pair of irish glasses um but i've never had the kind of the i never had the kind of the, the cop on or the eureka moments to to address that issue so when i see like the most successful brands and even when i talk about jim plus coffee and and sculpted they have the ability to um they have the ability to initially acquire a customer with a quality product but then they can continue to sell items to that to that actual customer. So while there's there's one stream of work for them that goes towards acquiring new customers, but they are really maximizing that pool of current customers that they have. And that is something that Amber never did. So what was happening to me is I was selling customers at a grow selling glasses at a growing, growing, growing rate. And I just hit a, I just hit a ceiling. Like mm-hmm. during COVID, everybody wanted the glasses. I talked to random people, uh, meet random people, and they're like, oh my God, I bought a pair of those glasses during the pandemic. And you just realize, Jesus, I actually just did hit like the ceiling. I was playing a volume game in Ireland, which doesn't work. Yeah, you maxed out, yeah. Basically, basically maxed out. Now you could say, why didn't you go to the UK or the US? We have a lot of sales in the US and UK, but it's much harder to sell. Cost of a customer, cost of acquiring customers way higher. That goes back to me not having enough margin to actually make that a viable business strategy so um where am i going with this um is that yeah i think in e-commerce you've probably got two options and that is you know high margin once off purchase and i say once off by maybe like once every two once every two years and you do a volume you do a volume game on that consumer electronics something something along those lines you just like get loads of volume on it or separately um you um you find a product that you think is really good and you think that it satisfies the need of a certain person you sell that product to these people and then you sit back and you go what else would these people like you know rather than what i was doing is just like foisting glasses upon as many people as possible Mm. knowing not not really realizing that they're not going to come back for four years so um this is why I kind of am pivoting the brand more so now. I'm rebranding it as a um, uh, performance and recovery eyewear brand, dropping the word eyewear, um, which gives me a lot more flexibility in the future for when I acquire customers um, and I'm not kind of tied to the to the eyewear mm. pigeonhole. You know? So what are we moving into? I'm moving into um, more of the more onto the sports sports side. And there's a reason behind that. There's a few reasons behind it. But if we want to talk about a Eureka moment, um, I recent, very recently, uh, like seven, seven, eight months ago, um, I started getting orders from professional footballers. I was like, this is so random. Why is uh, Patrick Bamford, who plays for Leeds, mm-hmm. or ordering, ordering glasses here? Then I got another order from um, the, the striker for the women's football team in Ireland. Um, her name Amber Barrett. As this is this is weird. Why why are all the footballers buying pairs of glasses? And then I realized Erling Haaland had gone on the Logan Paul podcast 
and he had uh, spoken a lot about the importance of blue light glasses for him as a recovery tool. <coughs> um, and uh, I said, Jesus, that's, that's interesting. Like, you know, and I, I love sport. Like, you know, I, I, I love like running and um, I've always been interested in sport. It's a big part of my life now, especially in my mid thirties. Mm. I can't, can't be in the pub every weekend, you know, I have to be doing something, something healthy. Um, and I just got the, the cogs moving in my head and I was like, Jesus, that's what I want to do. Like, I want to, I want to have a sports brand. I want to have like some sort of sports or performance performance brand. And I already have a product there that is being used by lots of athletes. I just need to kind of position it a little bit differently. Um, and then I think about what I just talked about with the um, knowing your customer audience and selling them more products. And I think about the typical Amber customer. They're, they're people who, you know, they might work in a tech company um, they spend, they work at a screen, um, that's why they bought the glasses in the first place. But outside of that, you know, they're usually people who are very interested in their health. Uh, exercise is such a huge part of life now in Ireland. Um, so it just became apparent that, and I look at people who tagged Amber on Instagram, they're out in the weekend cycling, you know? And that was the eureka moment. It's like, oh, I already have that cohort of people here. I'm just playing in this tiny, narrow part of their life. Yeah. Like, why don't I expand into other parts of their life, you know, and provide them with, like, really cool products that they love for other things that they do. So that's where the idea for Ever Amber came, came about. And, um, yeah, so we're, we're basically, we're, we're launching new IRA ranges for um, performance, which is, like, running, cycling, anything outdoors, um, and recovery, which is the important part. Yeah. That's the, the blue light glasses, the Erling Haaland glasses for improving your sleep. And well, sleep has become such a big thing. I like what you're doing here because you're, you're not like trying to be and reinvent the wheel. You're not like, oh, I'll just start again. I'll just scrap it, which a lot of people do. They're like, oh, I'm just sick of it now. I'm just going to scrap and start again. And they spend all these this time and money trying to start a new thing. Whereas you're going, wait, I have something that was working exceptionally well at one point. How can I just improve that slightly and mm. already take because you have a massive customer base mm. so now you're and if you're watching on youtube you'll be able to see the glasses in front of dan here um like you're taking something very clever and just tweaking just, just tweaking, tweaking yeah. just it's tweaking making it more flexible yeah like growing it out giving it a little bit more flexibility but i think that's time. massive for for entrepreneurs listening is is not always to be chasing the shiny new thing which i think we're, we're often guilty of you have to look at what you already have and go mm. how can i already serve them because there's that stat of a cost 10 times more to get a new customer i'd probably imagine that's gone higher now and in, in the world it's probably higher to acquire a new customer whereas you've all these customers who are happy they've already bought from you they're already in the funnel you already know them you can already contact them like just so many reasons to just look at what you already have that, that's that's exactly exactly it um, and you know I look at Amber and I look at the the list like the customer list that we have in Shopify um, and always been great feedback always been great reviews and it's a, it's it would be a travesty like I thought about closing down Amber Eyewear and just you know just lick gone like just take it off my mind it causes me too much pain but then I just look at like some at the reviews random messages from people saying how much they love the glasses when is another one going to be in stock and you're just like it would be an actual travesty if i just cut the cord on it when it may not have even scraped the potential do you know um and i feel like this kind of repositioning as performance and recovery eyewear makes a lot of sense um in terms of like you know that balance balanced lifestyle you know you work during the day but you're, you take your exercise very seriously on the weekend you take your running very seriously we see that with like running clubs cycling clubs running is having an absolute boom it's at the huge, minute. huge, it's huge everywhere because people have kind of gone people during covid are like right what can i do i can go for a run it's about the only thing i can do is i can go for a run people are like oh okay kind of into this now and mm. now there's a huge social thing i think that you, you you've tapped onto something very important here because i think because people there's a number of trends happening that kind of work from home thing and then people are now going, well, I don't actually have like a social life during the week. They're now seeking out things like running clubs. They're seeking out things like competitions. They're seeking out like high rocks. There's a real movement towards that being your, your outlet. 
100%. your social thing is you get out of the weekend you go for a 200k cycle or a 10k run or whatever it is mm. um and people will spend money on their hobbies like the mm. people do have disposable income to spend on their hobbies if they're really into it yeah 100 percent. like i some of the best times for, that i've spent with my friends recently i've been doing competitions like that together like i've done quest that quest adventure race oh, series wrong, yeah. a few times and just uh, did the marathon belfast marathon last year with my friends um and i feel like at the age i'm at now like that's kind of where i get my pleasure now yeah. you know you know um and to to be able to now pivot into that market that i'm personally so interested in is um gonna hopefully be very fulfilling you have to me. enjoy what you do right as well you got to a point with with amber and you're like like what even what what even is this now it's like i'm just selling like glasses to people you know positioning them as like um oh you work in tech wear our glasses dirt your eyes won't hurt anymore and there's only it comes a certain point where you actually just can't say that anymore it just becomes so repetitive and boring to me like i was well bored. you've evolved massively as an entrepreneur that's why i was so excited to get get you back on because you your evolution is really interesting and i think this is a really interesting exploration because uh, the pod's going five years now and now people are coming back on and i'm loving to explore their evolution as a person and as an entrepreneur because that's where the learnings are mm. the learnings are in those hard years of yes graft and strain yeah. and it isn't really talked about and that's why i like doing these long form pods because that's where the learnings are and that's where people really need to understand is that it's not just like everyone looks at the drop shipping and all this crap on instagram mm. you're kind of going that's not real entrepreneurship no that's not real life that might work and you might get lucky once but you're not going to get lucky forever and it is going to come to an end mm. and it's the entrepreneurs like you who shift and evolve and learn and go right okay serious learnings here how can i get better yeah like that took real balls to go back to, and go into wayflower and go right I'm going to make myself an e-commerce expert here when realistically like the ego to do that you know it takes a takes a dent it does take a take a take a, a real <laughs> self-awareness to go i'm going to step back here for a minute yeah no 100 percent. and I, i'll go back to that that dunning kruger concept so i don't think i finished the point but i was in that period previously and I, I realize it now that you know i thought i was an expert because i didn't know enough and now when i joined wayfair you instantly see oh my god i know nothing so i think they call it like what the the the, the valley of ignorance or re ignorance realization or something like that and that's kind of where i've now i know obviously know more about e-commerce than the average person but for that year of working with like some of the greatest people that understand e-com and um, i've i've been in that zone now where i'm like oh my god I'm, I'm actually a complete beginner here and now i'm just feel like i'm just starting to get into the point where i'm like okay i'm pretty pretty good here i'm pretty confident i can have conversations with founders of you know six figure dtc brands in the states and not be out of my depth you know mm. and that to me is has been you know a massive massive kind of opportunity that wayflower has given me um it's been it's been class like it's been really good i always say this in the pod all the time you have to see it to be it that's mm. why I love doing these mm. because Ireland is full of incredible entrepreneurs, but sometimes you just don't know. Like it's what we said that you don't know what you don't know. How can you know what yeah. best in class looks like? And then in Ireland, there's a tendency you kind of like you, you're, you outlined it there. Lovely. Um, you kind of reach your ceiling and you're like, Oh, I thought there was more here. Mm. And then you're like, well, what is there? And you can, unless you're ex ex exposed to these massive global brands and you appear under the hood and you're like, Oh, there's, it's a whole other level of this game. Whole other level. Like that's that's. You the, think you're at a ten, the, and you're like, the, oh, exactly. I can turn this up to a fifty. The thing that we're lucky about in Ireland is that it's a, uh, it's actually, it's phenomenally easy, I think, to, to, um, to, to actually find customers in Ireland as a, as a brand. You think so? I think if you've got a good product and a good brand, it's exceptionally easy because everybody is willing to give you a leg up, and that that's like media, like yourself, like newspapers. I remember, like back in the day, you know, Sunday Business Post. Love and Dublin, etc. They'd be falling all over themselves to give you a plug. Mm. Um, may have got a little bit harder now. I'm not so sure, but um, it's very, very easy to once you have something that's that's really good, you know, and you do it properly, and you're not selling fuck, selling tat to people. Yeah, once um, your story is a story, you've got important. a good story, a yeah. good product. People like it, resonates. People can kind of connect with you, and they're like, oh, I see what they're doing there. It is actually exceptionally easy. But then the caveat to that then is that it's capped. You know, you yeah. you are going to run out of runway unless you find other ways to 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 start. 
bringing in money from customers that you but have. I think that's why this episode is very important because founders need to understand you know there's levels right mm. there's levels it's great to reach a level but then you know what does the next level look like so talk to me about ever amber then what what's our plan um so the plan i've been like p- plotting producing manufacturing over the last six to seven months to have a initial initial batch of initial range that like we're really really happy with a really colorful comfortable great quality nylon lenses which means nothing to anybody but best of the best lenses so they're here if you're on youtube you can see them in front of dan <clears throat> so talk yeah. to me about what i have in front of us here um i accidentally brought two pairs of white glasses they're not all white but um yeah just just some like a, a little different shapes like we on the left here we have um a pair that we're looking to position towards like running um a smaller lens and very light in the face don't even feel like you're wearing them and then more of the kind of like traditional shield lenses here for cycling um, there's a prescription insert that you can get if you need a prescription when you're cycling. Um, I've got a num- number of other, number of other uh, styles as well. So this is just what I could fit in my bag. Um, packaging, nice, nice packaging that we worked on. Um, and then you can see at the front there, there is a red lensed pair of glasses. Now these specific lenses, I've been trying to source these lenses for years. Um, there's very few companies in the world that have these these red lenses these are actually blue and green light blockers Mm -hmm. specifically for aiding sleep these are the ones that erling Haaland was wearing Mm. he gets them from a company in the states i probably i probably won't name them in case people i was gonna say don't give them a shout out god's sake um but they've probably been one of the only brands i've seen sell them and i just i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't source them Uh, i couldn't figure out where they're getting them from so but from the connections I made in the eyewear industry over the last couple of years, I managed to finally find these lenses. And I've been wearing those at nighttime, and I'm honestly not bullshitting here. I fall asleep wearing them because I just feel <laughs> like my, my phone and my laptop has like no impact to me. It's like reading off Kindle. Um, so gr- green light is something that affects sleep as well, which is not as well known. What's green light? It's literally like just further up in the light spectrum than blue, than okay. blue light. So blue light is like closest to UV light and the spectrum then comes green. But there's that that kind of range between blue and green is what can impact your melatonin production. Okay. Production. So if anyone's not watching YouTube, go subscribe because you should. Um, but I'll kind of describe they're like black frames, but then they have a red lens. It's kind of like, it's, it's red, isn't it? It's totally red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so they would be that recovery side of things. So, you know, wake up on a Saturday, go for a big run. It's sunny, a low sun. You need your sunglasses. Wear light nylon lens, like perfect visuals. When you wear them and um, do your exercise, come home, cook dinner, sun starts to go down, lash on your red lensed blue light blocking glasses um, and fall asleep a lot easier, deeper quality sleep. You can actually, I guarantee you, that will be reflected in a whoop strap. This is the day in the life of ever Amber. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then when you talk about how we move further beyond that, and um, again, to go back to an anecdote related to Wayflower, uh, last year, I, <clears throat> I went to Los Angeles to shoot uh, case study videos for Wayflower with some of, some of the best customers over, in, over on the West Coast. And um, I found this just like a proper light bulb moment. Um, I chatted with, there's actually two brands, one called SandCloud, who sell towels. They're like sandproof towels, towels, so you just shake them and all the sand falls off. Yeah. They're at, they're, what they, a niche. <clears throat> yeah, good idea. <laughs> like their shop is on Venice Beach, so it couldn't be in a better place. Fair enough. And then Ghost Golf was another one, a um, golf brand based in Anaheim. Both of those companies started out with a very niche product, which is the sandproof towels. Ghost Golf with a magnetic golf towel. So, you know, you take your shot, your towel is on the green. Instead of bending down, you literally just put your putter on it, pick it up with the putter. Um, which sounds ridiculous. But, it's uh, as niche as it gets, niche, but if you're a golfer, niche as you understand it. Gets. it. So he going to talk about ghost golf he sold like he launched those towels and instant like within a few months sold tens of thousands of them and then instead of if you juxtaposition that against what i did if that was me if that was like old me i would have brought out more colors of golf towels no what he did was he was like okay i know all these people that bought my towels are golfers now is the time for me to launch um, golf bags, premium golf bags, like expensive golf bags, high, high margin on them, lots of money to be made there, selling like multiple different golf products now because he had 
crowbarred his way into the yeah. golfing community with a niche product. Same with the, the sand clay, the towel guys. They actually started selling sun cream after they, they developed a, a sun cream, do you know? And that's that light bulb moment for me. It's like, okay, it would be extremely difficult for me to start a running apparel brand uh, now because so competitive, so competitive. However, if I can crowbar my way into these communities with a niche product that not many people are doing, which is um, sports sunglasses and like as I was saying, recovery glasses, I'm kind of inventing that concept. Mm. And then I acquire this like community, like, I acquire this, audi- acquire this audience of, of people who are runners, who are cyclists, who are interested in their health. Um, and then I can sell them a lot of stuff. Like they, then we can provide, I don't want to say sell them in a kind of a, no, but that's the Del formula way, for success. I, no, yeah. that's that's you know, it's it's a business podcast, so you can you can talk about you know profit laws, all that kind of stuff, and sales. Like that's the formula. Mm. You're, we're, we're here to like share your story, but also here to share the learnings. Like that is the formula for it success. Is, yeah. You can't just be a one and done kind of product. It is. It is the formula. So this like this 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 new brand, the the new angle, gives me a, gives us a lot of flexibility in what products we can sell, and I'm so excited for that. Like I can't wait till like what well, winter 2024 um and you know we release like a limited edition snood or windbreaker or mm. something specifically for runners like this type of stuff like, and you can stay in the conversation with the with the um exactly with your customers exactly. you've got something to offer them then you know yeah. you're not just banging the old drum buy a new pair of glasses please discount well, but also like and i say this all the time is that you know no one really cares about you right you, you know you care intimately about your product but as an entrepreneur you have to be able to stay in the conversation you have to stay relevant mm. because people's lives move on different things happen you move into different stages you have to stay relevant you have to stay in the conversation whereby you occupy that retail space in, the, in your customer's head and you have that emotional relationship emotional relationship is key you have yeah. to be able to stay there like whereas if, if you're just there once and you know, maybe they might buy, they might not. Um, but a lot can happen in four years' time. Mm. You know, are they going to come back to Amber? Don't know. But now the fact that you're becoming part of their everyday lifestyle, it's it's huge. And like, you, you're doing something smart, which I think is you're tapping into the performance and recovery market. Like, I wear my Whoop every day. Mm. I've worn this since 2019. Mm. I have I would, an aura. I would not do it out. Mm. And people are like, oh, it's expensive. I'm like, it's 20 quid a month to know what's going on in my body. Mm. How on earth is that expensive? Yeah, it's a great product. It's right. wild. Yeah. Like, and I and I only I'm so bullish on the performance space, the longevity space, the health span space. We're only going to become smarter and more savvy about what's going on in our bodies. Mm. It's like the the Jeff Bezos thing with Amazon. He's like, are customers going to want products quicker? Yes. Are they going to want them cheaper? Yes. I think we'll be okay. Yeah, you know yeah, that yeah, yeah. you, you got to look at what's in front of you and go. Are people going to want to live healthier lives? Yes. Do you yeah. want to sleep better? Yes. Yeah. You have to look at these trends and go. Instead of paddling out against the tide all the time, kind of go right. Where are the waves coming from? What are the next big waves? Definitely, mm. running is a massive trend that's only going to continue. Health and performance, massive trend, only getting bigger. Mm. So, like I love what you're doing in the space. I think there's. And another angle to it as well is that, uh, and it's so important, is like the content side of it. Like that opens up a whole new avenue when you're in the sports and performance and recovery side of things. Like the content that you can produce yeah. has just infinitely more potential. Yeah. It's so much more entertaining. It's interesting. It's People interesting. care. It's interesting. It's cool. Like we did a photo, we did our first photo shoot there like a few weeks ago. And I recruited uh, lots of very fit people from my gym. And uh, I was just, it was just great. Like, you know, you just got so much more flexibility there with the content you create and how exciting it can be. Whereas you, I saw the little teaser clip on yeah, yeah, yeah. LinkedIn yesterday, I think it was maybe. LinkedIn, yeah. yeah. A girl running on the beach. Yeah. 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 So excited to, to get all that. And um, I think that's where, that's where my, I'm not very good at that kind of content side of things. You're obviously very good. But like founder, founder led brands who, who, where their, where their founder has a very strong personal brand. Um, oh, it's just such a bonus like that is. Mm. Like, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that personally. I just find, I don't think I'd be that type of person. But there's so many but people now. There's so many like, people I can maybe leverage as ambassadors. Have you seen Ollie March on in the UK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. I was going to say George Heaton. Yes. Uh, represent, yeah. 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 But, like, but, but that's just, a gr- again, trends, no, trends, I'm not, trends. I'm not George Heaton, but... 
Uh, they're but, absolute units the two but, lads like they're so fit like it's incredible but like there's there's so many people in that space you know you don't have to be all things to all people yeah but it just shows you what's possible it shows you like like the content they're creating is beautiful and people want to consume it you'll mm. sit down you'll watch 20 minutes of these guys vlogs mm. i sat down and watched an ollie march on blog all he was doing is organizing a community run yeah but i sat down for 20 minutes and watched this vlog about it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh 100 percent. um so i've i've reached out to like a number of like people within dublin who are involved in running cycling clubs um, who are not necessarily have loads of followers, but just produce really good content. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my plan for this month now is to start kind of like seeding out products, products to those. And, um, you know, just to, to, to kind of just see, get feedback, obviously, but also with the intention of like get, having them featuring in their content and you know using it ourselves and it's the nice thing people actually want to support local kind of they do but also people want to consume that kind of content yeah they want to kind of watch and go how does that guy i said it to you you should check him out as well nick bear you're kind of going how does he run what does he eat what does he wear Mm. you know people are curious about that kind of stuff people are into that content to go okay i'm gonna you know okay i'm only running a 5k but i still want to you know figure out how to do in the best way possible yeah yeah where can people learn more about Ever Amber just before we finish up and go to a quick part <laughs> round? So it hasn't launched yet. So um, I don't know when this podcast airs. I'm not sure when you intend to air. A couple of weeks time. Um, so I am hoping to launch on a, probably the first week of April. And the website will be uh, everamber.com. E-V-E-R. A-M-B-R. Uh, in the meantime... Um, I'm actually not sure. Just hang tight, hopefully. Oh, yeah. follow us. Uh, follow follow us on Instagram. I was going to say, yeah, surely sorry. there's an Insta. Come sorry. on, of surely course. there's yeah, an yeah. Insta. Perfect. Right. Let's yeah. move on mm. to our quick fire round. God. What book would ever should every entrepreneur read? <laughs> oh, what did I say last time? I think I said like David Goggins' book back back then. I have no idea. Um. Oh man. That's 250 episodes. I'd say ago. You've uh, you've really caught me there. I am actually s- going to be so bold here, and like, I actually haven't read that many books recently. Interesting. I'm I used to be a big reader, but like I've just I don't know. I need to get back into it, but I've I've become more of a uh, a Twitter scroller. What's the biggest thing you've learned about yourself over the last couple of years since pivoting the business? Uh, I am hugely tolerant of risk and discomfort, which is a it's a it's a it's a good thing in a way but um maybe a bad thing because i can sometimes take some bad risks but i think i really think that's a core component of a of an entrepreneur is not freaking out when things go to shit what would you do today if i give you 10 million euro um i would probably <laughs> uh i would give it i would no i'll tell you what i do I have a friend. I have a friend in Canada called Henry who actually started a roller skating brand, and he was on Dragons Den over in Canada. It's very entrepreneurial. We get on very well. We've been friends since we were kids. I've always wanted to start a business with him. I fly him back. We'd sit in a room for five days and come up with an unbelievable brand and no expenses spared. Launch some something class. Love that. Mm. Random roller skating brand. Good for him. What's <laughs> something in your daily routine you wish you started sooner? Um. Cycling to work. Life hack. Like it. I'm going to give you one million euro, but you can only invest in one company or person. Who is it? Oh, um, he's going to love this, but um, I met a, a contractor came to Wayflower called Will O'Brien. I don't know if you've heard of Will. <laughs> His yeah. name pops up a lot. Yeah, I, had, I met him for lunch the other day and he's just like, such an interesting character and just very intelligent full of energy has a really cool startup that he's working on um had a viral tweet there recently i don't know if you saw the that. Kerry Gold the Kerry Gold one i i i would definitely i would definitely invest in will i would i would say luke mackey as well but i'd say everyone says luke mackey he was on this week actually yeah 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 luke's cool yeah. but yeah will will's coming on my radar a lot now i'm gonna have he's to on investigate David Mark Williams a couple of weeks ago yeah i'm gonna mm. have to investigate him a little bit more if you start a new company in the morning you kind of are but if you start a separate new company in the morning what would it be <clears throat> i have looked at the crash situation in ireland and if i was inclined to you know i love products and brands blah 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 uh, if i was on the techie if I was more on the SaaS techie side, coming up with some sort of um, company like that, I would be looking to try and solve some issues with the te- with the crash 
industry, cost, um, how we can make it more efficient and reduce the cost. Mm. We have our daughter in crash now. It's a, it's a wild ride. Getting them in and then keeping them in is yeah. something something else. I agree. What do you believe other people find strange or strongly disagree with? What do I find strange that someone would disagree with? Mm. <laughs> uh, Come on, we want something uh, controversial. Give I it to us. Fr- I would... <laughs> Um, mm, uh, oh, I don't want to be too controversial. Um, say say the question again, sorry. What do you believe other people would find strange or strongly disagree with? I sometimes believe that the Irish government is actively out to work against the best interests of its citizens. Like genuinely, not even in an accidental way or an incompetence way, like genuinely fully trying to make life worse. For people i think a lot of people probably agree with that yeah. so it's not yeah. not that contrarian yeah. what's one thing in in your life that you spend money on that brings you immense happiness um oh god um new products like just like just seeing cool cool e-commerce brands like i have like an aura ring on i bought like hoka shoes and um, i love i love i love that i love seeing cool i love seeing cool brands doing cool stuff and have them arrive nice i think that's that's a pretty Crap answer, but no, that's, that's fair enough. Try new products. What's your final piece of advice for every entrepreneur listening? Um, it's very cliche, but <clears throat> like never, never view um, difficult periods and failure as a as a negative and the end and the at the end of things. Like it, the more times that you can fail and accept it, it uh, is just an unbelievable bonus going for it. Like you just feel you kind of feel bulletproof, I suppose. I agree with you. It's only failure if you stop. So exactly. Never, yeah, never exa- exactly. So never exactly. stop. Exactly. Damn. And I think success, success is probably, unless you're very lucky, success probably comes from how many times you've failed before. 100%. So. That's why I call the pod the entrepreneur experiment because you just got to keep trying and keep testing. Mm. Dan, you're a symbol of that. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Very enjoyable. You made it all the way to the end. Click here to subscribe to the channel. Click here listen to last week's interview we do these interviews every single week so hit subscribe i'll see you in a few days